Can you hear me? Uh, this project is a collaborative venture uh, between uh, three groups. The genesis of this uh, application started uh, many, many years ago. I was a patient of uh, Dr. Cruz, who is a well-known uh, orthopedic and microsurgeon. The conversations, you know, in the, in the doctor's <laughs> consulting room uh, meandered away from a treatment to uh, research tools to help young or budding surgeons get experience in very complex procedures such as orthopedic and microsurgery. Uh, down the road, you know, at the Gini conferences, I met my other main collaborator, Dr. Paramesh from Wisconsin-Madison. And today we're going to talk about the changing environment where technology can impact two major areas which has been identified by US Ignite. One is healthcare, and the other is education. You can go to the next slide, please. So our goal is very simple. Although it's a very complex process, we want to be able to train surgeons. Of course, we chose orthopedic surgery for a number of reasons. But from remote locations where, let's say you have a master surgeon, right? <coughs> surgery is very complex. Those of us who have undergone surgery will realize it's quite different from engineering, right? The experience and the expertise of the surgeon dictates the outcome of the process, and there's a, a range of details and procedures and factors that come into play. So our goal was create a virtual reality environment, a physics-based environment, and this is a, a long-drawn process, and we are going to show you our work in progress and what we have developed so far. So right now, you know, if I went to uh, a surgical, uh, I shouldn't say environment, if I went to a university which exposed uh, residents to become surgeons, you would deal with cadavers, which is not a great option because it's very expensive and there's, there is a risk of infection, or you would deal with animal models. Today, you know, using animal models is considered unethical, you know, as we humans progress. Uh, trying to use the animals to test out various procedures is uh, gaining far less acceptance than it was before. And the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, and Dr. Cruz can talk more about this, they have encouraged the use of virtual environments as they provide a whole range of opportunities. A, a, a medical residents, you know, can, can interact with the virtual environment any number of times, and they can learn from the mistakes rather than learning through, you know, in the actual surgical room. Okay, can move on. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cruz, who's going to be talking a little bit about the, the challenges in surgery. And go ahead. Well, <clears throat> good morning. Well, first and foremost, I'm involved in a teaching program, teaching young surgeons how to uh, learn orthopedic skills. Orthopedics is a very large field and has a whole array of different uh, procedures to do. But during the residency, they get exposed to various areas. So this is important that they actually get their hands on and learn. Surgery is a field that you have to touch in order to really understand. You have to have that proprioceptive feedback. And this is where the combination of a virtual environment and uh, some of the haptic models, which later we're going to move into, really become very useful for learning the skills that's required. Now, if you're very squeamish, you don't, may not want to look at this, but you can run this video real quickly. Go back, please. And just show the video. This is just one procedure that we uh, do, and it's actually a procedure for someone that had an elbow injury that basically was not moving. He was fixed at 90 degrees, and we just show how you have to release all the structures and then put a frame on. So, next slide. So, that's just one of the many, many procedures that some of the residents have to learn. Now, in the process of this particular surgery we picked out as a prototype for learning uh, this type of environment, we're going to concentrate on the steps four, five, and six, which basically involve the so-called list plating of a, of a femur. A femur is actually the thigh bone, and list plating is one of the uh, tools, if you will, or one of the in implants that we use in order to address some of these uh, serious injuries. So in this uh, demonstration, we go over the, you can go back, uh, we go over the uh, insertion of the, of the assembly of the list plate, and then actually the insertion and then lastly, the insertion of the screws. Next slide. So here's, here's an example of what I'm talking about. All the way off to your far left, 
is an injury x-ray. Someone comes in, and this is the knee that you're looking at. You can appreciate the degree of uh, many pieces and fragments that are right there. So this is a high-speed uh, injury, and you have to try to put all these pieces back together to try to give this person a joint that they can actually walk on and bear weight. So it is important to her to learn these skills and, and, and to see what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So this is pretty much what we're trying to achieve. And if you come all the way over here, this is the way it eventually ended up. Now, it may not look pretty. It's certainly not back to a uh, normal state, but you can see the restoration of the uh, joint surface has been accomplished. And this is like one of the goals of this type of surgery. So this is what we're trying to do and use this as a prototype for the simulation process. Okay. So let's run a little, uh, dem this is just a diagram just showing you what the uh, construct looks like, the jig with the plate, with the screws, after it's been put back uh, together again. Let's run the uh, demonstration. Okay, so this is a, a two-part demonstration. The first one we're going to uh, show you. What do you want? Will be the, the assembly of the for a specific process called list plating. Basically, the first step is uh, lifting the jig and then having a plate attached to the uh, jig. And you have to put this in the correct sequence and you have to make sure it lines up because this is how you can actually take the surgery that's very, very invasive and uh, be able to do it through a very small incision uh, by having this jig uh, that you attach to it. So you'll, the surgeon knows exactly where those screws are going and it's done in conjunction with uh, x-rays. So here we have uh, a knee on a table with uh, an x-ray unit and a, a table that allows for this type of surgery to be performed. And now it's been inserted through a very small incision through a knee joint all the way up. And then you check the alignment with the uh, x-ray and a lot of it is done in so-called closed uh, situation. And this is the skill that we're trying to teach the, uh, right. the uh, yeah. residents. So in the, in the second demo, while this is uh, going through the process, what we are planning on doing is this. Uh, in the teaching environment, we're going to have a master surgeon in one location. And rather than have the surgical students or residents fly in from different parts of the country, he or she will be able to walk through them to the complexities. And one of the biggest advantages is we can change the constraints, change the surgical uh, alternatives itself, and compare the, the pros and cons in a group-based environment. And that's where the, the Genie framework uh, comes to help us. So we're going to do that in just a few seconds. Okay. You know, just one quick uh, point I'd like to throw in there. I, uh, a lot of my residents, when they finish their training, they go off to uh, their active duty military, and they go off to Afghanistan and to Iraq. And every so often, I get these calls coming in. You know, Dr. Cruz, what, what should I do with this kind of injury? This is a perfect environment for really being able to relay this kind of information and be able to actually communicate with them. So this is really good in that respect. Okay. So we're just gonna just show you a little aspect of, uh, of these live. Um, and now uh, with this capability, you actually have the ability to actually touch uh, the various uh, implants and then manipulate them around and, uh, and do whatever you need to do to try to get the skills that are necessary. So you have uh, one of our students who is uh, mimicking the role of a medical resident from a different location. You see him, he is uh, sitting on the other desk over there. And uh, the network, we are able to fully understand and follow. And then Dr. Cruz can, you know, obviously when they're making a mistake, because uh, medical residents, even though, you know, they've put in a good number of years of education, require some uh, mechanical as well as, you know, scientific skills over here. And we're just going to show just a, a small portion of it. Okay. Now, eventually, this is actually a start. Eventually, we like to go to a haptic model where you can actually move and see, and this is really, really good for any interaction. And he's just showing actually just lifting and manipulating the jig. And, uh, and you have to be able to line everything up appropriately and be able to target each of those holes because you can't see it. And now he's just moving the plate into position here and just showing how that uh, works. And, and this procedure that you're going to see, it's called uh, list plating uh, surgical process. You know, when a person's uh, femur breaks, then you have to, it's sort of a very hardcore engineering task in many ways to assemble the fixture. If you make mistakes and then when you do the cut, obviously the, it's going to affect the outcome. 
So this is one area that Dr. Cruz has tested with mm -hmm. some of his, uh, his residents to explain the process. And then they can go back, they can repeat the you know, uh, same process until they get it right. Yeah. I'd like to say something also from the educational point of view. <laughs> to make a fully mature surgeon, there are some critical steps and even some mistakes that need to be made for a surgeon to really mature to get to a certain level. And it's nice if you can do it in this kind of environment where it really is not really uh, just like a pilot when you're flying the plane right. and you, know, you let them make the mistakes right. so they learn. And yeah, that's exactly. how they really learn. And that's this is what's uh, really good about this sort of thing. All right. Okay, he's just okay. manipulating the play right now. I think so. Zach, yeah. Hit the automated sequence. Okay. Now, okay, I mean, while, while he's showing you manipulating there, that is like a remote surgery. Actually, the network that is there is running. We are using the Genie framework to make this happen. So actually, the servers, since the residents can be anywhere across the country, although he is here, but all the network communications, the servers that are running here in Wisconsin, and we have Genie slices uh, provisioned across the country, to, and the communication is taking place from, from here, going to the servers in Wisconsin over the Genie network, a low latency provision for low latency, and that is coming back here to as if the surgeon can see. So, so it kind of exactly replicates the situation what one would happen if the residents were distributed geographically. Now let me explain in the next few minutes a little bit more about the details of what is going on underneath in the network layer, what the Gini network and the low latency capability has enabled us to do. Right? The, especially the software-defined networking part of the genie. Right? So the, the surgeons and the residents, as I said, can be anywhere across the United States, if it is a genie or if it is fire, then across the world. And what, I'll show you the, the thing is built out of a, a platform that does not support any form of redundancy. So when one is doing these kind of things in large scale, one, in addition to low latency, one of the things which, as uh, Glenn clearly mentioned, is the effect of drop packets, right? So, and failure rates that happen in the thing. So what we did was not only make sure that using the SDN capabilities, replicated the servers across the network so that even if one of the servers goes down while the education is going on, or you want to move some users from, for load balancing purposes from one server to the other. These kind of things can be made seamless to the clients or the application as it is going along. Right? So for example, here I'll show you what happens when failures happen. Right? So in general, the kind of communication which SDN enables us to do is as follows. Right? Let's say the client wants to send a packet. Right? It gets, instead of talking to a real server, it kind of talks to a proxy server that is implemented using SDN capabilities right? on a genie slice that is in, currently running on a genie rack in Wisconsin. Right? The, using the SDN capabilities, the packet is, gets replicated into two and sent across a genie slice, which is provisioned for low latency, to two different real servers of the application. These two real servers, of course, then will generate a response. And this response comes back to this proxy server that is running on the Genie rack in Wisconsin. Right? This, the, using SDN capabilities, only one of these two packets gets selected and gets forwarded back to the client. So the client, as far as the client is concerned, sends one packet and gets one response. Within the network, using SDN capabilities, it is replicated so that even if for example, a failure happens, say this link goes down, or the server goes down, if this link goes down, the thing would remain seamless and continue to operate without any uh, disruption to the application that is running. Right? So for example, here, as you can kind of imagine, this, the packet would go here, the, it would get replicated at the genie rack, but because the network is not there, one of them would get dropped, whereas the other one would kind of survive to the other server and come back out and go through, go through the client unhindered so that the application continues to run. In fact, while we were doing this, this was the kind of thing that was going on in there, both the networks, and we, could, we were actually dropping packets from one of the servers while this was going on as we were doing this live in here. Right? 
So, and this is, as Glenn mentioned, the kind of flexibility that the US Ignite and the high bandwidth uh, and the low latency capability and the software-defined networking of US Ignite that makes such applications possible. And the other nice part of it is that this application kind of is completely unaware of it, and it has been written without knowledge of these things, so the network only takes care of it. Right. And, and uh, before thank we you. forget, we do want to acknowledge funding from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Lyles is not here. He's attending a different meeting. And we also want to thank Glenn. We nearly missed the deadline on the funding <laughs> solicitation. If not, uh, Glenn uh, or Coffee, who just told me, you know, we have one more day or something to turn the EGO proposal in. We do appreciate all your help. Thank you. Thank you.